theme tune. <laughs> Did any of you watch um, the BBC Songs of Praise today at lunchtime? It was absolutely fantastic. I would really recommend watching it. And uh, it's all on um, death and grieving, but very, very helpful and some wonderful testimony. So I would really recommend that. But anyway, here we are at our Songs of Praise. And uh, welcome to this New Year one. I think it's taken a few people by surprise because, of course, with the first Sunday of the, of the year being on, a, on the first, it seems a lot um, earlier in the month. Um, the normal. Um, but uh, anyway, here we are, and uh, it's good to be together and good to be able to worship God and good to sing some of these great old hymns, which have got such fantastic words in, haven't they? Yeah. So um, let's pray as we come to worship God together. Father God, we thank you for the start of this new year, and Lord, we don't know what this year will hold but we praise you for life. We praise you for the measure of health that we have. We praise you for all the good things that we have in our lives. And Father, we pray that this year you would help us to get to know you better, that we might understand and embrace more of your loving plans for our lives. So we pray that you would Reveal yourself to us today and that we might have joyful spirits as we lift our praise to you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So we're going to start with a great hymn of praise, all creatures of our God and King. And it's all about joining with the rest of God's wonderful creation in bringing glory and praise to him. So if you'd like to stand and you're able to, then do. If not, just stay seated or whatever is comfortable for you. Let's sing together.
I wonder, as you look back over the last year, what uh, sticks in your memory. For some of us, it's been difficult times, and others of us, we've had much to rejoice about. But I wonder, as we look back, as we think of God's faithfulness, I wonder what comes to your mind, God's goodness to us. I, uh, As I look back, I... Um, of course, I came to God Manchester a year ago last October. And so uh, when I look back to last year, I praise God and thank him for um, being settled now in my own property, my own house. And uh, just seeing uh, lots of visitors and just enjoying that blessing and being able to give back to him. I wonder if anyone else has got any, um, any things they'd like to say thank you to God for, any highlights or any thoughts of God's faithfulness. Just have a little think for a minute. What might you, you might not want to share them, but uh, if you do want to share them, then just stick your hand up. Yes? Tomatoes. Tomatoes. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was a good year for tomatoes. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> do you like tomatoes? <laughs> yes. Yes, Joe. Retirement. Retirement. <laughs> okay, yes. And Joe, of course, now hard at studies, training to be a lay pastor. That's something exciting, leading her into who knows what, God knows, uh, for the future. So anything else anyone wants to... Yes, Ruth. Yeah, the family being able to be together. We've had two years, haven't we, uh, previous to that, of just the agony of not being able to see people we wanted to see and how the world came to a standstill. And then, of course, the joy of being able to be together and being able to be together as a church family as well. Of course, that happened last year as well. So uh, anything else? There was one over here. Yes. Pleased to be back with the fellowship. It's brilliant. Anything else? Yeah, Judy. I really enjoyed being on a real holiday. Being able to go on a real holiday. Mm-hmm. I, I, I love going on holiday in the UK, but I actually have set myself a target of being away and doing some travelling. So I went to Iceland. Well, I'm quite sure. <laughs> <laughs> Jumping on a plane and actually adventuring somewhere else other than the UK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, Di. I think what I thought was over there was watching the grandchildren. Mm. I mean, you thought after COVID when you couldn't see them, mm. just seeing the joy from the, the change in some of them mm. and to see some of them walking with the Lord and just so exciting to see that. See the see lots of see lots of families together. Yeah, it see. doesn't happen very often, and it's lovely when it does. Mm. Yeah, mm. yeah, family together, and just seeing the development in grandchildren. Mm. And um, yeah, I, I was looking at our toddler group uh, last uh, Wednesday, and just um, even over the Christmas period, they seem to have shot up. And um, you know, it's uh, it's great to be together again. Well, there have been lots of highlights. Yeah, Anne. Yeah, so Anne's giving thanks for provision in a care home for her lovely dad who um, had been in hospital, but just the, um, yeah, the, the speed with, with which that happened was really an answer to prayer, wasn't it? Yeah. And we know that God has been present even through the difficult times, and whether we have sensed his presence or not, uh, the Bible assures us that he has walked through those times with us, the difficult and the good times. And uh, the word of God says that he's a faithful God and his love never changes. And his love endures forever. His love endures forever. (laughs) That's the one. 
<laughs> yep. So we're going to sing a greatest thy faithfulness. And let's thank God that even in the very difficult times, and some of us have had a very difficult last year, that God is still faithful and he is still walking with us hand in hand. So let's um, give him our praise and thanks as we sing that great hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Well, Jude mentioned about um, having gone on her travels last year, and she's off again. So I'm going to leave her to tell you about the um, exciting adventure she and some of the others in this room are going to be going on. So over to Jude. Thank you. Um, afternoon. Um, I've just spent a few days at High Lee down near Hoddesdon, which I've never been to before. I didn't sleep very well, but there you go. Um, and I was there as part of the team for a mission direct. And one of my observations that a few of us had actually was, if you've been to High Lee, you can sleep about 300 there. And there was 30 of us for mission direct and about 100 from Chelmsford Diocese. There was about another 60 from St Albans there with the bishop. And do you know what? The one thing we all had in common... It was not the tattoos, it was not the dog collars, it was not the same poor sense of dress like myself, 
It was the fact that we were all there because God was doing something. And do you know, that was exciting. Um, I know I've got a reputation for being slightly bonkers. I really don't care. Um, God uses the peacemakers and God uses the bonkers. That's fine. That's great. But it was just so inspiring. It was about 200, 250 people in the centre, all doing different things. And it was the way God could make use of every single one of us to do something. And there were some very cool tattoos. They really were. They really were. So in three weeks' time, I will be at London Heathrow, Terminal 4, about to get on a plane to fly to Kenya and on to Zimbabwe. Because taking, I am taking a team with Tim Martindale and a couple of other people out to Zimbabwe. And we are going to be working really hard doing some jobs. James Ambler, please come here. (laughs) He doesn't know anything about this. (laughs) No, no, no. No, I'm not going to beat you up, don't worry. I'll do that when we're away. Where will you be in four weeks' time? Mm, Same place. You will be at T4, Heathrow, waiting to catch the same plane a week later, won't you? Yeah. And where are you going? It's not a trick question. Where are you going? Um, Zimbabwe. With me! (laughs) And what are we we going to do in Zimbabwe? Um, Deal with the school. Right, okay. You better put them on. (laughs) Come on, put them on. Put them on. You say bossy, girl guiding would say it's future leadership material. Brilliant. And shall I put mine on as well? Then we can both look daft. Okay. Okay. So what are we going to do with our big our big orange and yellow gloves on? What are we going to be doing with these, do you reckon? Are we going to be doing clapping? Okay. Are we going to play... Uh, what was it? Uh, one banana, two banana. <laughs> was it three banana, four? Are we going to be doing things like that? No. no. So what are we going to do wearing our bright orange and yellow gloves? Um, brick laying. We're going to be doing brick laying. How, how many, bit, how many bit schools have you built? None. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Whilst we are there, the plan is that this is a continuation. This is the 11th year Mission Direct have been involved with this particular school in Matari, which is a township down the eastern border of Zimbabwe. And when you're up on the hill, you look into Mozambique. So we are building classrooms 19 and 20. And what else are we building when we are there? Do you remember? What's one of the most important things that we can provide a lot of snotty (laughs) school children with? Hospital Hospital would be amazing. I can't do that in two weeks. (laughs) We're going to build a toilet block. (laughs) You know, this is high-scale glitz and glamour of missionary work. That's what we're going to do. We're going to build a toilet block. James... (laughs) No, you're going to film. What? This is really important. I am presenting James with his team T-shirt, so he really is part of the team. One of the things I'm most looking forward to taking uh, James and my son Jonathan, who's 21, and Connor and, Connor and Harrison and Kate and all the others. Yeah, right. <laughs> is that we are all going prepared to meet with other people where they are. We're going to be playing games. We're going to be building classrooms. We're going to learn how to build toilet blocks. We're going to be painting. And we're going to be meeting people who are in need. We don't have all the answers. We don't have endless pots of money. We do have enthusiasm. We do have builder's gloves. And we've got a genuine love that we want to share with them. And a great way to share the love of God is by example and by education. And those are the kind of things we're going to do. So you've got your T-shirt. And so he's really, really super duper part of the team. This is a hoodie. And the hoodie 
is important because on the back of it, it's got lots of information about where Mission Direct goes as well. So James, not only have you got your gloves and your T-shirt <laughs> and your hoodie, and I'll tell you why it matters. When we go, th oh, and you'll have a bag. There you go, nice purple bag. The reason it matters is when we travel, we travel as a team. So in four weeks' time, I think you're meeting in five weeks' time for Songs of Praise, aren't you? That will be our middle weekend of our two weeks in Zimbabwe working as a team. Please think of us. One of the reasons why we have team T-shirts and team hoodies is so that we come together as a team. None of us have got all the answers, but it's amazing what God does when he brings people together to go and do something exciting. And this is exciting stuff, and this is God's love in action, and how exciting that he can use James, are you perfect, James? Not all the time. Not, oh, not all the time. <laughs> yeah, perhaps I should ask Anna Martin. Um, and of course, I'm perfect all the time. <laughs> I did have my fingers crossed when I said that. Uh, the point is, isn't it fantastic that God uses the people like us who are not perfect, who are a bit mad? My skills are very limited. I like talking, I like people, I believe in gossiping the gospel and just fabulous that we can do that as part of a team and we will be together and we will have a great adventure as well and that's just brilliant. So thank you, please pray, please pray and most importantly, please pray. That's great, isn't it? So uh, we're going to sing, um, of course, they, uh, as Jude said, they uh, go to do practical stuff, but they want um, the love of Jesus to be made known. So we're going to sing um, that wonderful hymn, Tell Out My Soul, The Greatness of the Lord, and then Ken's going to bring our reading to us. Thank you. reading this afternoon is taken from Genesis 
and it's uh, chapter 2 and verses 4 to 9 and then 15 to 25. You'll recognize this. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created, when the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Now, no shrub had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant had sprung up, for the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no one to work the, work the ground. But streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east in Eden, and there he put a man, he put the man and sorry, he put the man he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden, there were the, there were the tree of life and the, sorry, the laser glasses aren't working properly. Uh, let me say again. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The river watered the garden and flowed from Eden. From there it was separated into four headwaters. The name of the first was Pishon. It winds through the entire land of Havila. And then 15. 15 to 25. It's very quiet in here. <laughs> the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat of any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will, sure, you will certainly die. The Lord God said, It is not good for a man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was the name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib, and had taken out, he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. And the man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united with his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. Well, we're going to be starting a new series um, this year, looking at um, God's big plan for the world. So we're going to try and span the kind of message of the Bible through our songs of praise in coming months. And uh, we're going to use various images to help us as we look at that wide sweep of scripture. 
And this afternoon, we're starting off beginning, as um, Julie Andrews would say, we're going to begin at the very beginning. We're going to start at the very beginning, and we're going to start with the garden, with a garden. When I was preparing to move to God Manchester, um, people told me that um, the sunsets in Cambridgeshire were amazing. And uh, this is one that I took from my window. And they are, aren't they? They're amazing here. And I'm sure you've had moments in your life when you've been absolutely stunned by the beauty or the power or just the awesomeness of nature. Can you think of times when you've just been stunned by what you've seen around you? Um, I, as many of you know, I grew up in lovely Swanage in Dorset and um, uh, visitors to our house. We, we're very high on a hill. My dad still lives there. Uh, absolutely one of the highest houses in Swanage, actually. And uh, as you look out from our lounge window, we've got a sweep right across um, Swanage Bay. So we see the Isle of Wight over here sweeping around to Bournemouth and then the Purbeck Hills and then up the valley towards Corfe Castle. Uh, and visitors to our house would often <laughs> ignore us and rush to the window. <laughs> it got to be a family joke. Um, but I, I can think of endless times when I've stood uh, by the sea on a stormy day just marvelling at the power of nature. And other days when I've stood on a really calm day just gazing at the beauty and the stillness of the sea and the different colours of green and blue and greys. Just uh, fantastic. And creation is amazing, isn't it? I was just thinking about the fact. Uh, do you know how many... How many species of bees there are in the world? Have a guess. Any bee? Uh, any bee. <laughs> well, that's one. <laughs> um, Anyone know how many? Okay, I'll give you a clue. How many thousands there are? Of 32. 32. Not quite that many. 20,000 species of bee live around the world. And... Um, we apparently have 250 species just in the UK alone. <laughs> That's amazing, isn't it? So next time you see a bee or get stung by a bee, it's just one of 250 species. Yeah. Yeah, it's not not nice, is it? Yeah, but <laughs> absolutely. Yes. Well, uh, there we are. Bees are amazing, though. And um, as are all of creation. Have you ever thought how a woodpecker can bang its head so often and not knock itself out? <laughs> Isn't that amazing? What about this? How does a dandelion work its way through concrete? Isn't that amazing? Whatever scientists tell us, the Bible makes it clear that there was a mind and creator behind our world and cosmos. And, of course, this is hotly debated in our world. We mix in circles where people uh, do not believe this necessarily. The opening verse of the Bible, as we know, states very simply that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Just like that, that's, that's the statement. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And according to God's word, as we know, our world and universe weren't just the result of a random happening or an accident. They were made by God for a purpose, as were we. And the first two chapters of Genesis unpack the creation story, how God created the heavens and the earth and everything in them. First, the light and the dark, the sea and the sky, the lands and the plants, the sea and the moon the fish, the birds, the animals, and finally, humans. If you think about it, God could have made everything black and white. But instead, he chose a wonderful colour palette, <coughs> so beautiful that sometimes it takes our breath away. He could have kept things simple, but he designed with such variety such intricacy, such precision. It's no wonder we sometimes say, wow, because he's a wow God and creation has his imprint on it, all over it. 
And the creation we see around us reminds us, reflects God's beauty, his creativity, his power, his goodness, his order, his attention to detail, his care, his generosity, his amazing mind. Someone once said, it takes more faith to believe that the universe came about by chance than it does to believe in God as creator. It's an interesting thought. We're told in Genesis 1.26 that the pinnacle of God's creation is us, humans. God said, let us make mankind in our image. He's talking there to his son, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, the three of them together at the creation of the world. He says, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image, in the image of God, he created them, male and female. Like the rest of creation, we were made to reflect what God is like, To be made in God's image means that he made each of us to reflect his character into the world around us. We were made to show his goodness and his kindness and his love and his gentleness, his faithfulness, his generosity. I could go on. And God also gave humans the task of being his representatives, of ruling his world on his behalf. We know that that's an awesome responsibility and one that we haven't done very well at. And of course, it's very topical, all the climate change talks that we're having at the moment. And we can sense God's joy and satisfaction as he looked out over his first creation. God, we're told in verse 31, saw all that he had made and it was very good. Everything was as God wanted it to be. And God doesn't make mistakes. That means he didn't make a mistake with you either. He loves and delights in you, whether you realise it or not. Just as God took such care over his initial creation, of course, we're reminded in Psalm 139 that he created our inmost being he knit us together in our mother's womb and later in that passage it reminds us that all the days ordained for us are written in his book we are not an accident or a mistake some of us may have been told that that was the case but not in God's economy God has plans and purposes for each one of us whatever age we are And primarily, he wants us to have that close and intimate relationship with him that Adam and Eve first had when they walked and talked with him in the beauty of the Garden of Eden. And that's the kind of relationship he wants us to continue to walk in right to our dying day. It's not a one-off decision to follow the Lord Jesus. It's a lifetime choice to walk and talk with him in intimacy and closeness. But of course, as we read further in Genesis, we find that Adam and Eve's relationship with God was soon spoiled by their rebellion and their disobedience, by their desire to do life their way instead of God's way. They thought they knew better than God. Uh -uh. We often do too, don't we? God had provided everything for them in every way. They didn't lack anything. They had the best of everything and an abundance of everything. And to top it all, they had the love and the counsel of their creator. And yet they still wanted more and different, as we often do. That sense of rebellion is in our hearts, not only in Adam and Eve's heart. And they did the very thing that God told them not to do, eating the fruit from the one tree in the garden he'd told them not to. You can eat the fruit of every tree, he said, but not that one. Every tree. 
in a paradise. <laughs> but not that one. And of course, they use their free gift of free will that God had graciously given them to choose a path that led them away from God rather than staying on the path that he'd lovingly designed and chosen for them to flourish on. As creator, God knows what is best for us. He knows how we tick. He knows what thrills and delights us. I've got this thing about bargains and it always makes my friends laugh because God's always given me little bargains and I almost feel his smile over me when I get them because I love them so much. <laughs> In fact, when I go on a holiday with some friends, they, they, they ban me from the B word because it annoys them that I get so many bargains. <laughs> <laughs> but God knows that that gives me a little bit of a thrill and he loves to give us what thrills and delights us. He knows how we can get the best out of life, how we can reach our potential and reach and find fulfillment in life. But because he loves us, he allows us to make our own choices. He doesn't ever force us to love him or to follow his ways. But as Adam, as Adam and Eve found, there are consequences to going our own way. If we reject the Lord of life, then the consequence is death. Going our way, own way, which the Bible calls sin, separates us from our holy and perfect God, not just in this life, but forever. Sin not only spoils our relationship with God, but we just have to look around us, don't we, to see that it spoils our world too. As a result of Adam and Eve's choice, death and pain and weeds and hard labour, toiling, came into the world too. Never what God intended for us. God didn't intend us to have to strive. He'd given them the world to tend, and that was a bit of pruning here and a pruning there. It was a nice, joyful activity. It was meant to bring them joy, not the back-breaking pain. It's a uh, heart destroying isn't it when we weed the garden only to go back a week later and it's all gone uh, gone up again and we think oh why did I waste my time that was never God's intention sin distorts God's image in us instead of reflecting his beautiful character we're often selfish and greedy and unkind and impatient and hurtful and ungrateful and when we read through the creation story we sense God's heartbreak at the end of Genesis 3 when he when Adam and Eve are banished from his immediate presence not from his presence full stop but from his immediate face-to-face -face presence but thankfully nothing takes God by surprise and God's immense love for the world wouldn't leave it there his love such is his love for the world before the creation of the world, he had a master plan to reconcile each and every one of us back to him. And of course, we know, as we know our, uh, the Bible, we know that Jesus' life and death and resurrection are the key to this reconciliation. And we're going to look more at this as we um, unpack this theme in coming Songs of Praise through this term. But we've been looking at the Genesis story today and uh, we've been looking at God's wonderful creation, that first creation. But in 2 Corinthians 5, we read this. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ. Although Jesus had never done anything wrong, he came to this earth to die for us. And as he did, he took the punishment for our rebellion and sin so that we could know God and experience that intimate life he had always intended. And God has made it possible for us to come to him, to come back to him through what Jesus did on the cross. And we can come to him with all our faults, all our failings, all our regrets. We don't have to live in the past. He wants new for us. He loves making things new. He offers forgiveness and hope and a new start. And it's just wonderful that no one is beyond his redemption. God is a God who recreates. 
he's able to take the old and make something beautiful of it. I don't know if any of you have ever seen the Kintsugi art work. This is a Japanese art of turning what is broken into something new, giving new life to it. Kintsugi literally means to join with gold. And uh, what they do is they take the, um, the flaws and the, um, the brokenness of um, pots and cups and things, and they fill them in with gold and make something new and beautiful out of it. It's a wonderful thing. And each piece is unique. Each piece is individual. And that's us, isn't it? That's us, flawed, scarred, marred, sometimes by our own choices and sometimes by the choices of others. And God is able to take our scars, our flaws, and to redeem them, to make something beautiful out of them. He can take those cracks and make gold out of them. That's what he wants to do in our hearts and lives so that we become more like the Lord Jesus, displaying his beautiful image, having a positive and wholesome effect on our broken world, introducing other people to the wonder of a relationship with him and the hope that we have if we love and follow Jesus. And what is that hope? And I leave you with these words, Revelation 21, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And I heard a loud voice from the throne say, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. That perfect relationship in the Garden of Eden that was spoiled by rebellion and the mess and the pain that resulted of that. That's the same for us. We live in that period of rebellion. Our hearts are not yet made perfect. We live with that mess. And yet God came in the person of his son to redeem us and to restore us back to that perfect relationship with, with him again through the Lord Jesus and all he's done for us. What a wonderful thing that is. That circle of redemption is a wonderful thing. And all because God loves us, loves us still. And he made us to have that close relationship with him. So let's let's. Uh, as we walk into this new year, determine that we're going to walk with the Lord and we're going to walk in step with him. And we're going to keep walking with him, hand in hand, keep bringing our flaws and our brokenness to him. Those times when we fail him, we can just come back to him and allow him to walk us forward and give us that new step again, that new start again, as we, just like toddlers, get up and start trying to walk again. And we walk hand in hand with him, his big hand and our little hand in his. And it's not like we hold his hand, because if we hold his hand, it's easy to slip out again. But he holds our hand. And so that can never be broken. So we praise him for that. We're going to sing of that great love that he has. And we're going to um, just reflect on that. And we're going to praise him for his greatness in all that he's done for us. Let's stand and sing How Great Thou Art. And after that, Ruth's going to come and pray, uh, lead us in prayer. Thank you.
I don't know if any of you are like me. You decide on a particular day, sometime after Christmas, that you're going to put all your Christmas things away and then you're ready for the new year. And sometime later, you suddenly spot a star or a reindeer or some such thing and you realise you just didn't quite finish that job. So... I still feel a little bit in between Christmas and New Year. I know we're well into the New Year. But this is our first songs of praise for this New Year. So as we start that together, we're going to begin our prayer time this afternoon by listening to the words of a short poem, and then we'll pray. And if you listen carefully, I think, to the words and the ideas, you'll see it follows well from Carolyn's talk about creation and then brokenness and redemption, and also our place in God's big picture, made in his likeness, and to be his representatives. The poem is by somebody called Howard Thurman, and it's called The Work of Christmas. When the song of the angels is stilled, when the star in the sky is gone, When the kings and princes are home, when the shepherds are back with their flocks, the work of Christmas begins to find the lost, to heal the broken, to feed the hungry, to release the prisoner, to rebuild the nations, to bring peace among the people, to make music in the heart. So let's pray. (coughs) Heavenly Father, as we hear those words and ideas, lost, broken, hungry, captive, destroyed nations, discord and war instead of peace, our minds go instantly to individuals and situations that are on our hearts. And we acknowledge that at times our hearts are very heavy. For some of us this afternoon, our prayers may be for ourselves because of situations we find ourselves in. For others, our prayers will be for particular people or situations known to us in our families, our communities, our country and our world. But we come before you, our God, this afternoon as thankful people. Thank you again for Christmas and what it really means. Thank you that Jesus came as our Emmanuel, God with us. Thank you that the Bible teaches us that Jesus came to seek and to save the lost, to bind up the brokenhearted. He fed thousands of hungry people with bread and fish, and he is the very bread of life. He came to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. He came to bless all nations, tribes and tongues, and to rebuild and restore the broken places. He is our Prince of Peace. So, Lord Jesus, with Christmas behind us, and the new year stretching out ahead, we pray that you will bring each of us all that we need right now from you, and that you will show us how we can each play our part in this work of Christmas. Through your Holy Spirit, please equip us to respond to the needs all around us, and to show your grace, compassion, and love to others. Amen. Amen. And now let's say together the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Thank you, Ruth. So um, just before we bring our service to a close, a few announcements. Um, thank you to all who've taken part again, as usual. Thank you to all those behind the scenes as well. Um, the next Songs of Praise uh, in February and March are both on the 19th, so that's nice and easy to remember, isn't it? 19th February, 19th of March. Um, we've got uh, various courses and things going on, so if you know people or if you yourself would like to come to a three-week course called Hope Explored, where we'll be looking at some of these themes, um, three-week course on Monday afternoons, then do have a word with me over tea. Um, just if you've never seen a baptism by full immersion, if you've never seen anyone go into a baptistry and go right under the water and come back up again, um, in the morning service on the 29th of this month, so in a, a certain week after next, one of our young people, Katie Ann Buckingham, is being um, baptised by full immersion. So you might like to come uh, to that as well. And just a reminder that, um, you know, Songs of Praise today on the television on BBC One was very good. I would recommend seeing it. So um, have a look at that. We're going to end our service with another wonderful hymn. I will sing the wondrous story um, of the Christ who died for me. Let's stand to sing. And then I'll close in prayer. Thank you. Father God, your word says that hoping in you, will, we will not be disappointed and that those who hope in you are blessed. 
So may we open our hearts and our lives to your love and leading. And may we know your blessing in the coming days. Thank you for tea together and uh, the blessing of fellowship over good food. And we thank you for those who have prepared our tea for us. Thank you for all your many good gifts in Jesus name. Thank you. Do stay for tea. And uh, I just need to say that um, Philip would have loved to have been here. He was due to speak um, today, um, but we know that Philip's had an operation. He is home. He's recovering and doing well, as far as I know, Jenny. So um, do continue to pray for Philip as well. Thank you. <laughs>